Hello and welcome. I'm Alice Grodnick, and this is Moving Up, a podcast about secrets to success, struggles along the way, and life in general. Today on the pod, Mandy Cavanaugh, the author of a new book called F the Glass Ceiling. Start at the top and stay there. Mandy and I, we have a great conversation about entrepreneurship and learning how to find out what lights you up. Let's just jump right into our conversation. All right, Mandy, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Alex. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, I'm excited to, excited to chat with you. You've got a, a new book and it's got a very provocative title. I'll let you say it first. You can I say S- F the glass ceiling. F the glass ceiling, start at the top and stay there as a feminine entrepreneur. It was called forget the glass ceiling, but you know, when you're trying to sell a book, they talk you into those kind of, you know, <laughs> those kind of titles. More <laughs> provocative, the better. But it's it is it's got some controversial stuff in the book as well. So it's probably a good screening device. Uh, I love it. Is this so? Is this the your first book? It is. Yeah. And how? So I'd love to hear about like you know how you came to this. Like how how does how does one go through life and then end up writing a book? You know, called F the Glass Ceiling. Well, I started out um, in corporations, working for a little while. That didn't work out. Um, I was always trying to improve things, fix things. I had a real entrepreneur streak um, a mile wide, but I didn't realize that's what it was. And then I ran into some coaches um, at a workshop, an entrepreneurship workshop or a leadership workshop rather. And I, I saw uh, what they do is they measure what lights you up. I think that's, that's commonly a commonly used phrase nowadays. And what lit me up oddly was telling people what to do, which is kind of embarrassing. But that's when I figured out that I was supposed to be the boss instead of working my way up a corporate ladder. So not everybody's cut out to, I mean, I'm a team player, big time. Um, I love working on teams, but I, I like to kind of set the strategy and really work on um, strategic activation, building business models, building systems and things like that. And so um, I started a company and then at the same time, those same coaches offered a coaching certification. And so I got a coaching certification to help train entrepreneurs. And I ended up uh, leading some seminars with just females only, uh, feminine entrepreneurs. And this was before we had a lot of role models in the feminine CEO space. And, um, and so I was just sharing my story with them and they seemed to really gravitate towards specific things that I would share about my experience. And it, it always surprised me, like how to work with men and how to do this and how to do that without losing yourself completely to your masculine side. And, and so as a result of that, I ended up, you know, starting to do some writing and I had one of the participants said, you should write a book. And I said, yeah, you're right. I should, you know, she said, no, I'm going to help you write your book. So she started interviewing me and we recorded it. And that became the first manuscript. Oh, Awesome. And I mean, your story really resonates with me because I had the same thing. I was working for these, you know, big companies and it's like these prestigious investment banks. And it's funny because like I'd worked my whole life to get that job and society was saying, oh, like, look, look how much money you're making. You're you're doing so well. But it was never right for me. And I like you, I didn't know at the time either. And it took me going to business school to figure it out. And I had the exact same uh, moment where I figured out what lights me up. And that's when I started like down this entrepreneurial path. But um, how do you like, how do you, what do you tell someone that's like just doing something? You're like, they're like, ah, oh, I don't know if this is right. Like, how do you, how do you start to like, think about like what lights you up? I mean, it's quite frankly, a, and literally a, a physiological phenomenon. Your, your breath gets really deep. I, it might make kind of take your breath away to think about it or, you know, it's not a logical thing. So if somebody says, what do you really want? And, and they're, it kind of takes getting feedback from someone else because we, we typically, when somebody says, what do you want to do? We come up with these ideas of what we should do. And that's a result of programming throughout your school ages. Right. There's nothing wrong with it per se, but it's just, you have to undo the programming and you have to get curious. So you have to get rid of all your judgment about things. And, you know, just so what, what makes my heart jump? Like, what if I could do anything? You know, one of my children wants to be an entrepreneur and she has a certain degree, which would make her suitable for like tech, supply chain, that kind of thing. But what she really lights up on is something entertainment related, like mini golf, you know, and um, there's a way to make money at that, you know, and, and, you know, it's like, what is it that when you are doing it, you would do it? If you had a million dollars in the bank, you would do it anyway. And so for me, that is working on teams and working in organizations. Um, 
that should also play into it is when do you find yourself kind of losing track of time? When do you get excited about what you're working on? And uh, how you know you're an entrepreneur, in my opinion, is that you are always looking to find fault in the organization that you're in. Like you see how it could be better. That's I know who the entrepreneurs are working inside my company. They're the ones who always say, this is what we could do better. Now, whether they're going to go start their own business, sometimes I hope they don't. But the ones that are really aggravated by their inability to make a strategic impact or a tactical or systems impact are the ones that should go start their own businesses. Right. I mean, yeah, you're right. That's always, sometimes that's, I mean, not sometimes, most of the time it's easier said than done. Cause like in your experience, when you took this, uh, when you figured out that you like telling people what to do, it's like, all right, well, how do I go do that? What does that mean? Do I have to leave my job? I mean, those, those are all scary choices. It is. And, and there are certain, you know, indicators as to what area I think it's good, you know, for you to go into. Like for me, I knew I was interested in real estate. I was always talking about it, noticing it, real estate development. Um, and I also wanted to sell to businesses. I didn't want to deal with the public per se. I just wanted to deal with like corporate, you know, businesses. I like the the higher dollar values. You know, that's just me. Some people want to open a restaurant. Some people want to start a nanny service. Some people want to do a pet resort or they want to start a software company. Um, it depends. I mean, and we have enough tools out there now to know everybody has really ready access to profiling tools where you can get to know yourself and your occupational DNA. Like there's the culture index, there's the strengths finder. I love strengths finder. You know, there's the Enneagram, which is kind of a psychological type thing too. But you have all these ways to, to measure yourself to the extent that your, your proclivities and your strengths can be measured. And I'm a big fan of following another way to do what lights you up is to um, develop your career or your business around what you're str strong at. Yes, I have weaknesses that I would like to overcome, but I don't want to spend a career trying to fight against my weaknesses. I would rather start something that, you know, I bring team members in to fill the gaps where my weaknesses are. So, yeah. yeah. Totally makes sense. I love it. Okay, so um, we've heard about how you came to this book. I'd love to hear about the book and like, you know, the content of it and, and what it's all about. Thanks. Well, the, the book itself is really about, it's for existing CEOs of offline businesses. There are a lot of entrepreneurs that are really kind of building an online brand. Um, not saying that you couldn't have an online brand and this book still applies to you. Like if you're doing an e-commerce site or something like that, but if you're a solopreneur, it, you know, you might find it entertaining but it's really more for people who are going to have to build a team and who are going to build kind of a legacy business. So you're, let's say you're, you're an entrepreneur or you're a corporate leader who has a ton of responsibility and you don't want to deal with the pressure anymore. You'd like to use all of your work ethic and your intelligence and wisdom to start your own company. This will help you decide whether to start a company. And if you already own a company, it'll help you decide whether you want to grow it. And if you are already growing a company, it will help you be more high performance in your leadership. Wow. I'm, not much of, I'm not much of a manager and you can go find, you know, there are millions of books on management, but this is more about feminine leadership. So it, 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 I have a lot of guys, I know a lot of guys that have read it, but it's about people who want to leverage what comes naturally to them in order to be high performance. I love that. I mean, I, lo I love this, like what you were talking about earlier of, having a job that plays to your strengths. Like, sure, I've got things I'm not good at. I don't, I'm not that great at marketing. And in the last startup I was at, I was running marketing and I was like, I, every time I had to think about it, I hated it. Versus when I started to do finance stuff, I was like, oh man, this is like, I'm in the zone. I feel so good. Sure, it would be nice if I could get well-rounded and be finance and marketing, but it's like, I don't know. I, I, I have companies that will pay me just to do the finance stuff and I enjoy the hell out of it. So like, why am, I, why am I not just doing that? That's it. And, and the people who work in my accounting department, they have to love numbers. They have to, they have to love details. They have to love finding that last dime or quarter, you know, to, to find out where the, the missing, you know, dollar is. Um, but I personally, that's the worst part of the, of dealing with the company. I mean, I, I like looking at executive summaries of budgets and, and pro forma, you know, PL profit and loss statements, but to deal with documents and filing and like filing the taxes and doing, doing all of that. It would just would be and reconciling bank accounts. 
would be the absolute last thing that I would want to do. I would rather, frankly, mow lawns <laughs> or do something physical with my body than do that. I just don't. <laughs> I've actually never done any, any, I mean, I've had like physical jobs as a kid, but I always have this like in my mind that like being a farmer would be like my ideal thing. I would love to be like yeah. outside, like working with my yeah. hands. I mean, that's the furthest thing I do from, from, from what I do now, but I've always got it in my mind that someday I'm going to yeah. make, make, make my millions of dollars and then go be a farmer. And that's the thing about entrepreneurship is you can be multidimensional. Once you get your business going, you can also start other things. You know, I, I got my corporate housing company going and I got really burned out and bored because I'm what people would call a serial entrepreneur. I like the startup phase and I also like turnaround. So if it needs to be fixed and kind of turned around, I jump back in and do that. But I, I went and started a turnaround consulting job for that reason. It kept me so occupied and I would wake up at four o'clock in the morning and start sending emails and they would think I was such a badass. Well, now it's hard for me to roll out of bed at, you know, seven 30, but, but when I was on a new project, I, I felt different physically. So you could start a farm while you're doing the finance stuff, right? Yeah. So, so, okay. So Mandy, you're saying now that like just inherently women bring a different set of skills to the table than men bring, but like that hasn't, that's kind of been like pushed down in our work culture. Yeah. I mean, it's not completely different. Um, people ask me, well, what do you, you know, there's really not that much of a difference between the genders, but there is, there's a distribution curve and there's a lot of overlap. So I just say like masculine and feminine characteristics or energy. And um, in general, women have more feminine uh, energy than, than men, even though there are a lot of men who have feminine energy. I think we all can kind of agree on that. And there are people who have a really solid mixture of both. That's not my point. I'm not really into the identity stuff at this point because I'm not an expert. However, when it comes to business, um, feminine high performance or what I consider to be a feminine trait that is high performance sometimes goes invisible, sometimes has been undervalued at the expense of being competitive. And um, I'm, I'm a very, very competitive person, but I also know that, you know, let's just use a baseball or a softball analogy. It's a different, you know, it's a different personality that plays catcher, you know, as, as, as a second baseman, you know, you have, it, it takes a different skill set or a different, you know, even though it's the same game, you have to throw, you have to catch. It's a different kind of a thing to play catcher than, than second base. So and I've never used this analogy before, so I hope this goes well. But um, <laughs> but what I think is that women, uh, they don't compartmentalize as much. And, you know, that's been seen as a weakness because we see everything, we see more holistically and we don't compartmentalize. It's also a great strength. So you we see what the unintended consequences are. We can see, you know, if we say we're going to make this decision, we can see 10 steps down the road. You know, we can kind of read the tea leaves, if you will. And, um, you know, there are men who can obviously do that as well, but sometimes I think I'm conscious enough to say, I really need to compartmentalize this topic because I'm, I'm wound up or I'm overwhelmed or something. And I'll go to my CEO, who's a masculine figure. And I'll say, talk to me about this. And he'll put it in a box and it'll be black and white when we're done talking. And that's what I needed. Whereas I'm always, you know, I'm kind of his consigliere and I'll say, Hey, you know, I'll send him an email. Our, our agreement is that I'll send an email and in the subject line, it'll say advice. <laughs> and I used to just blurt it out. Like I'd give it to him on a text or a phone call. Now it's an email because that's, again, he's way more kind of black and white than I am. So in that body of that email, I'll say, you know, Hey, what about this? Or let me give you a heads up about what I see. You know, this is a potential area of opportunity or a potential risk that he didn't see because he is so kind of black and white compartmentalized. And, and that is a balance. And I just happen to be a female and he just happens to be a male. So that's why, again, these are broad generalizations, but that's why in my book, one of the chapters is about enlisting masculine support as a way to avoid what is now being seen as the glass cliff and not the glass ceiling, even in entrepreneurship, even in female owned businesses, Statistically speaking, there is a glass cliff or a glass ceiling, if you will, where a smaller percentage of female-owned businesses reach, you know, the million dollar mark, for example. And there've been there's been a lot of research that goes into, you know, why that is. And so when you enlist masculine support to bring the kind of thinking that, you know, the, that I'm just going to go back to the compartmentalization thing, it helps you get yourself kind of sorted out before you just go, look, the, I don't like the way this over here, my career is affecting my family or my relationships. So I'm going to opt out over here because that's what we do. 
we won't tolerate anything in our lives uh, negatively affecting another aspect of our lives. Whereas a guy will, men are, you know, the studies show that men are expected to do so and do so on a regular mm -hmm. basis, like a culture of overwork, missing the kids' soccer games, et cetera. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting, Mandy. I mean, it's, basically just all goes to creating a, you know, a diverse team that has different strengths and different weaknesses. I mean, back to that analogy of me not liking marketing, it's, it would be silly if I just had my company and we, we just had a bunch of crappy marketers. It's like, well, why not? Why not go get someone that's like great at this and I can be good at that and we can combine. And, and so, yeah, it's nice having men and women and people that think this way and people that think that way. And like, that's, that's what a well-functioning team should have. Every, every company that values diversity should be looking at people's perspective and energy and everything from obviously, you know, promoting different ethnic backgrounds, different, you know, genders and different marketing versus organizers, all of that. I just, I think it's a really good idea to have a diverse, a real diverse workforce and not just check the boxes and then make everybody be the same. Absolutely. So Mandy, where, what, what are you working on next after, I mean, you've got this book out into the world now, I assume you're trying to get it deep into the world and get lots of people to, to read it and, and, and hear your message. Um, but what are you working on, on now? Well, I've got a couple of things I'm working on in the, I'm writing articles for a, a large outlet and they're more leadership in general, because I, I have declared about three years ago, a massive leadership crisis on the planet where leaders are trying to divide us all, you know, and they use language that's very unconscious, very divisive, and not just in the political space, either, but although that's pretty rampant. And I'm starting to write a manual for it. And um, I founded a, an organization that has, it's sort of in an incubation per period now, it's called Source Leadership Institute. And my goal and my hope is to do trainings and workshops um, on leadership in general, connecting leaders to source. And I'm also running, um, helping to run some expansion projects in my, uh, my original business, like the corporate housing business and land development, things like that. So I have, still have my hands in multiple pies, if you will. Yeah. I mean, as you said, you're a, uh, you're a starter, you're an entrepreneur, you're a doer. So you want, you want to be, uh, this is what fulfills you is, is having your hands in all those pies. Yeah. And my kids are grown and they're in their twenties. And so I'm, I'm looking to build some potential projects with them, which is super exciting because they're all very capable and it's great when they become smarter than you. And <laughs> so I'm, I'm, you know, providing a little bit of wisdom and maybe some investment and they're looking at different things. It's an interesting market right now, post pandemic to see what sectors are growing and what sectors are, are going to suffer, what's going to never be the same again and, and what's going to flourish after, after all this passes. Yeah. I mean, a crisis like this presents a tremendous amount of opportunity. I mean, there, yeah. that's just, that's just how it works. There's, there's a huge shakeup. So if you can figure out something, a new way of doing business, then yeah, that's, that's awesome. So um, Mandy, I, I'd love to, like to get to the uh, advice portion of this podcast, the last piece here of, you know, what you tell, what you tell your kids, like your kids are saying, oh, I want to go work for a big company. I want to be an entrepreneur. I don't know. I don't know quite what I want. Um, how can you like help frame up someone's mind that's like, you know, going through that type of decision making? Well, the first thing I look at, as we kind of alluded to earlier, is what is their, what are, what's their natural, um, most enthusiastic state, if you will. So my son is a project manager. He has an MBA in project management. And, you know, the businesses that he would look at to start, or we would, you know, look at for him to be involved in would have an opportunity for him to, to create order out of chaos, to you know, manage multiple things. It's a management thing. Whereas, you know, I have another child, uh, my daughter, who's more of a leader and she wouldn't be as much of a manager. So, you know, it would be what, what organization or what opportunity would require her to inspire, you know, influence, um, delegate, you know, create, you know, create systems and not necessarily follow them you know, be a follower and create systems, I mean, follow systems that have already been created. And then I have another child who's kind of a combination of both. Um, and she's, I, I see her as like a real process improvement person. So if she were going to start or um, buy it, we were going to buy a business, it would be find a company that needs to be run more efficiently 
and could double or triple in size just if they would get, you know, this act together or get this, you know, get this thing going. Like they'd never had a really good outside sales team. She's, she would be that kind of activator, if you will. So, you know, I'm a big fan of, of having the business work for you or having your job support who you want to be. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't love challenge. So pick a job that's going to be a stretch for you and is going to grow and develop you in positive ways. It doesn't always have to feel good. Um, and then at the same time, find a balance where you actually get to provide value based on what is innate in you. It's kind of a balance between those. Yeah. Two well, congratulations. It sounds like you have some very self-aware kids. Thanks. <laughs> we spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff. It's kind of odd, right? <laughs> so, yeah. But you're right, I've never heard it phrased that way because, you know, Warren Buffett just says, always take the job where you learn the most, not the one that pays you the most. And like, you know, over the course of, uh, I mean, how long are, are, are your kids going to live? And uh, I mean, are we going to live till 150 years old? So we're going to work for 100 years, like over the tiny little learnings, you know, every week of a, over a hundred year career will be like so meaningful. But then you have to balance that with like, all right, well, here's what I'm good at. So there's this, I like it. I, I really like how you, how you phrase that. And also, you know, I, I, I think this is, I've done a few podcasts now and I, I promised myself that on the next one, I was going to mention something along these lines. I didn't have the words formulated, but I want to say this. If you're listening to this and you say, I don't recognize any of this in myself, I, I would never presume to be able to take the risk or just to kind of put myself out there. I don't know where I'd get the money. I, I, I'm too tenderhearted. I'm too, like, I don't want to manage a bunch of people. I don't, what do you mean create systems? Like, you could still be a super effective, high performance, be, you know, human being and, and, and meet challenges and provide value and even make a lot of money. You don't have to be like this whole thing about hustle and CEO ship and all that. You don't have to be an ambitious CEO type to apply these principles. And you can, you know, you can just recognize that in yourself. Like, I don't want to be in charge. I want to be on a hyper, I want to be on a team. And I want to be appreciated for what I do, but I don't want to be pressured with you always have to be better. You know, I want to, so you find the culture, I guess what I would say is that then it's important for you to find a culture where you feel nurtured because not everybody wants to go and be this, you know, power hungry leader you know, yeah. <laughs> or money hungry. If you, you know, some people just want to find a place that feels like home and make a contribution and there's nothing wrong with that either you know, you have to have a ton of resilience and a little bit of insanity to want to be a CEO. And I mean that respectfully. Totally. Yeah. I love it. Andy. So um, lastly here, I guess, tell us where, you know, people can, I assume they can find the book on Amazon, anywhere else. It's on Amazon and bar, bn.com, barnesandnobles.com. And yeah. my website is mandycavanaugh.com. And there's a way to opt in with, you know, you get a free chapter and then I've got some wealth tips coming out. Um, I think it's 52 wealth tips. I don't send a ton of emails. I don't do like an email list where you get an email every day. So if you sign up, it'll be just very gentle, like once a month, something like that. Awesome. Well, Manny, this has been great speaking with you. Thanks so much for coming on and doing it. Same. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. Good talking. Thanks so much for listening today. If you like moving up, the best way you can support us is by telling your friends and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks.